Hi, I'm Jerry Lipkin at Valley National Bank. We believe consumers need help understanding the complex banking and financial issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Berkeley College, Valley National Bank, New Jersey Resources, Create, NJM, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. Josh S. Weston, and by Verizon. Promotional support provided by HipNewJersey.com. Live hard, work hard, play hard. You're from New Jersey, and so are we. And by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got it this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce one of the nation's leaders when it comes to the field of autism. He is Dr. Joseph Hallahan. And um, he is the chief of the Child Development Center at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Good, nice to meet you, too. You told me that you got into this field 37 years ago? Yes. Hey, real quick, you told me that in another conversation. You and your wife? We met in medical school. Um, we both went into pediatrics. Um, I was um, drafted into the Army, and she joined with me, and we were privileged to do um, pediatrics. We yeah. worked as general pediatricians, and we learned about a whole component of pediatrics, developmental medicine, that yeah. we kind of fell in love with. We also realized what a, a desperate need there was for families to identify the problems their children were experiencing, to connect mm -hmm. those children with services, and to help them to be successful in the long run. Doctor, for those who do not know what autism is, describe it, or the so-called spectrum. Um, the, the autism spectrum is, is, is a condition um, in which children have two really primary concerns, problems with communicating and problems with social interaction and social participation. Is it either or, or both? Um, it's both. It's both, and usually there are, uh, there are repetitive behaviors and um, kind of a, uh, um, a desire to maintain um, um, sameness mm. in, in their lives, um, routines that they're comfortable with, but, but quite pronounced mm. sometimes. How often do you find that, because I know that early detection is important Absolutely. for treatment and finding ways to be helpful for children. How challenging is it dealing with parents who potentially sometimes are resistant to a meaningful, candid discussion about what the possibilities that their child is dealing with autism. Yeah, I know. You know, I think we, we appreciate that when, when we're working with, with a child, um, it's the most precious thing in the world to those parents. And it's very difficult for them sometimes to accept that there's something that, that may not be perfect with, with, with their child. And sometimes, they, in, in the beginning, they may, not, they may not accept the diagnosis, but usually they will accept interventions and, and resources mm. and, and um, work to help their children and their child to be more successful. Describe so, the work of the center. The center is called? The, the Binder Autism Center within the Child Development Center at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital. Break down that work. Um, we, we have a team of developmental pediatricians, pediatricians whose main um, responsibility is to evaluate children with learning, behavior, developmental communication concerns, and identify more precisely what the concern is and help connect those children with the services they need to be successful in the long run and to help their parents develop the skills to be the lifelong advocate for their child and helping them to negotiate. So let's break this down with a concrete example. As our team begins to roll some video from our, uh, we know that I happen to be watching, as I do every night, our partners at NJTV News, they're running a great story, a feature story on what you and your colleagues were doing with a group of young people dealing with autism and their yeah. parents. There was a bowling night, I believe. Talk about this bowling event 
and why in so many ways it was such a powerful and is such a powerful tool to help these children and their parents. One of the major lifelong concerns of parents of children on the autism spectrum is their inability to be included socially with peers, to make friends, to get out of the house, to be included in the, in the community. And we really worked at developing activities that would help the children to develop peer interactions, to, to improve their ability to work with other kids, to work collaboratively as part of a team, mm. to um, be a good winner and a good loser sometimes. To, um, to participate. In, yeah, to participate, to be included. And the, um, we developed um, in, in a small autism program initially, and it's growing now. It's in a 10-week program in which the kids meet every, every um, week, and they bowl as part of a team. There are three teams that bowl, and the children are connected with their team. Their parents are there, but the kids are working separately from the parents. As I was listening to the parents on that, that uh, story, the great story from, from NJTV News, some of the parents were saying that's also a respite for them. It's an opportunity for them just to know that their kids are having a good time, they're socializing, and they get an hour or so just to get a break. I think something that all parents want and cherish sometimes is that opportunity to, to sit back some and, and, and enjoy their time as parents, mm -hmm. but to enjoy the realization that their children are doing something that's fun and meaningful. Doctor, did you see, and if I'm wrong, you'll tell me this. There was a, um, a picture that, that exploded on the internet, social media picture. You may know the picture I'm talking about. About the young boy who was having lunch. Um, I think it was in the Carolinas or in Florida. And it was a football player. Uh, what was it? Florida State? The University uh, of Florida State? The University of Florida. Uh, a football player. They were just visiting this school. And this boy was sitting there having lunch by himself, which he often did. And this child, I believe, uh, is dealing with autism, has autism. He would eat alone. Long story short is this player went over and sat down and started a conversation with this kid. For whatever reason, one of the counselors took a picture, posted it, and people started reacting to it. And the player just said, look, the kid was eating alone and I wanted to talk with him. And he had an engaging conversation with the kid. People reacted to that because this kid was eating alone every day yeah. because the other kids didn't know how to interact with him. He was ostracized. After that, I'm not saying the kid's life has turned around and everything's great, but subsequent to that, a lot of what I read about it is that kids became more interested in talking to them. Am I making too much of that? No, not at all. I think that each step in the right direction really makes a big difference. And I guess it, it's two things that you'd love to see. One is the child develops better confidence in their own ability to step out and participate and be included with other children, and that other children learn to respond positively to kids with special needs and see that there's something so p positive and special about their child. You know, I mentioned that we help identify developmental concerns in children. We also mm. help families see the strengths in their children. Is that one of the right. primary, I'm sorry for interrupting, the, is that one of the primary goals of your center? I think that one of the primary goals of, of, of every good clinician is to help a, 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 their patient and their family see what's positive and strong and healthy within them and how they can use those skills to continue to improve. 37 years later, have you lost any passion for the work that you do no, for these children? I have more and more every day, I think, and more and more exhilaration at seeing um, so much accomplished, I think, of all of the conditions we deal with. Autism is one of the ones where early identification and early implementation of resources makes such a long-term difference in accomplishment. Dr. Joseph success. Allahan, Chief, the Child Development Center, St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center. You are doing incredibly important work, and you don't need me to tell you that. Thank you so much. Thank you to very you much. To you and your colleagues. P pleasure. Thank you. Stay Thank with you. us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you, Doctor. To Thank watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're at the New Jersey Sharing Network, and this is a uh, terrific day, the dedication of this uh, very special meditation garden. It's going to have a plaque. The plaque is going to have the name of Mary Ellen McGlynn, who is Family Services Coordinator at the New Jersey Sharing Network, has put in how many years here? I have been here since 1987, so close to 30, since it started. Mm -hmm. You came to this place, why? I 
was working as a nurse in uh, North Beth, Israel, as intensive care unit nurse, and I worked with both families of kidney recipients and saw what happened when they received a transplant, and then I worked with people that were became donors, and I saw what the families could do. just kind of seemed like the right place to come. What do families need at this very critical time, or that very critical time, when a family member... Um, is giving his or her organs um, and has passed. I mean, I mean that is something that's extraordinary. The living donor is one thing, but you lose a loved one and that decision has been made or is being made, what do they need? Right, right. I think, uh, and, and, my, and my feeling is that the primary thing that they need is a human being talking to them as another human being, compassion, but they need information. They need to be taught directly at the pace that they're ready to receive. They need to know what's going on. They need to know what their options are. And they need time to be present with their loved one. Mm. And I think we need to ask them what they need, you know? For you, I've often wondered how difficult it is for someone in your position, but how rewarding is it? Oh my God, it's amazing. I'll tell you, just last week, I was at a hospital with one of our coordinators with the family, and it made me think of this one. Yes, what do they need? And I said to her, what can we do for you now, for the mom, to the mom of this 20-year-old kid who was in a car accident? What can we do for you now? And she looked at me, and she said, you're doing it. What you're doing right now and making my son help somebody else, you're helping me by doing that. Just do your job right. So it's, all, it's, it's incredibly Emotional and powerful, difficult, but the most rewarding experience that you can be a part of. You know, we in the uh, ceremony today, it was powerful and emotional on a lot of levels. You did not expect, I mean, plaques are given for all kinds of reasons, and often they're not warranted. Today, that plaque in your name, it was an immediate standing ovation from all the people who were here. Uh, you're getting... <laughs> Why, why, that, why that reaction? Well, yeah, it was really special. I mean, this garden is so amazing and so incredible, and it's going to bring so much healing, as you said, to, to the families that come by. And I love it, and I love being a part of it. But to think that my name is going to be there, I just didn't expect it. It was really special. I'm very, very blessed and happy and pleased about that. It feels good. Word Association, the New Jersey Sharing Network. Oh, my God, a blessing to so many people. How special a place? The people that are here, the work that we do, the grace that exists with every family, every donor that we deal with, it's, it's just incredible. It's a special place. It's a special mission. And it's not a job. It's, it's a mission, you know. A job well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, guys. Hi, Steve Adubato. We're at the uh, Sharing Network, New Jersey Sharing Network, and we're talking with Jane Buckowitz. And you are here with a group of folks who are actually looking at the meditation garden. If you see that shot out here, the meditation garden, it's a special day. That's a dedication of the uh, meditation garden. Your son, Dan, um, helped so many people, um, not because... You wanted to, you were not because you ever wanted to be talking to me right now, but back in 2009, he passed. Talk about it. Okay. Um, Dan died in May of 2009 after a car accident. And um, we learned um, actually before that that he had elected to be an organ donor. Um, so it wasn't a decision that my husband and I had to make. He made it. He had made it, um, you know, simply by checking the box on his license. Um, through the DMV. So what we were able to do was simply just ensure that his wishes were followed, you know, when he was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury is what happened. So um, let's see, um, they, with the hospital works um, to, you know, keep his organs alive and, and volatile, you know, viable, excuse me. Um, you know, for about 24 hours. And then this organization is working diligently then to find appropriate matches. So um, we had the best experience with the New Jersey Sharing Network. They were just um, counselors. They were like family right from day one, um, just, you know, helping us 
be assured that what we were doing was, you know, a really good idea. And I, and I think that's exactly what's happened. You know, we have a daughter who was a teenager at the time. And I really think that the reason she's a happy young woman today is because, you know, of what her, you know, she lost her brother, but she was also able to say, but my brother was an organ donor, you know, so, um, you know, we're, we're very proud of him. It allowed us to continue to be proud of him even after he's gone. He saved lives. Yes, he did. Um, we heard from several of the recipients, you know, via letters. Um, one man, the man who received his liver, um, referred to us as his second family. Um, and he was a dad of three sons. Um, so like when you said it's true, like now he, he what he said um, at the time was he was going to get Father's Day with his sons and he never thought he would that year. What did that do for you and your family? It, it, you know, it took what we refer to as like a senseless thing and made it something meaningful. You know, I, I joked with him and I said, um, if all of a sudden you are a Yankees fan, or have a hankering for Sam Adams beer, I can explain it. You know, that's what Danny liked. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, we would have buried him and all those healthy, wonderful organs would have been in the ground. You know, and instead, many people, um, their li either their life was saved or it was improved. I mean, it's not always dr as dramatic as a life-saving organ like a liver. Mm -hmm. it, it could be a cornea. Or it could be like this one woman received his meniscus. And like she said, she'd been an athlete her whole life and had a really serious injury. And, and this surgery was able to allow her to return to sports. So You know, this, this garden behind us, I mean, again, you see all these folks out there. We had this dedication. And, and there are all sorts of people here today, uh, people like yourself, um, given the gift of life through your son and recipients and so many others people waiting. What do you think this garden represents, this meditation garden? Um, I think it is a place to reflect. I mean, speaking for myself, I don't, I don't need to be in a beautiful garden to think about my son, but I, would, I love the idea that I have this place to come to. Um, it's beautiful. Um, it's so well thought out, and it, it gives people hope, you know, for, for just the notion that he, 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 wasn't, he didn't lose his life in vain. Why do you still stay involved? Um, I think, as you said in your, in your speech, it's, it's just, it's an organization that um, they do such a great job with, with the monies that they collect um, to, to help everyone, like every day. Like imagine that being your job when you come to work, that you get to help people every day. I mean, now I volunteer to help here. Um, because it's a cause that I'm so passionate about. And um, I hope I get to continue to do for a long time. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Maria Teresa Montilla, who is president of Latino Leadership Alliance in New Jersey. Good to see you, doctor. Good to be here, Steve. Yeah. Let's talk about the fact that um, Latino representation in the state of New Jersey and the nation, interesting. Uh, percentage of New Jersey population that happens to be Latino is? Uh, roughly 18 percent, that of the national uh, percentage of Latino population also. Okay, so in New Jersey government, if you take the state legislature, right, an august body that I used to be a member of for a very short one term period, two years, back in the day, I remember we had very few members of the Latino community. Today, how many? We still have a too few among our senators and, and assembly people. Based on the population, really, we should be uh, roughly 18 percent. What do we in have? In representation, under 6 percent right yeah. now. We have two state senators that are uh, So Latino. it's Senator Teresa Ruiz and Senator and Nelly, Poe. Nelly Poe right here as we tape in Patterson, New Jersey. Exactly. Where she represents. So if two you, out of 40. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and overall, 
uh, assembly people, I think we have six or seven. Uh, Out of 80. If, but if you go by uh, percentage, you're talking about 18%, roughly. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that, that it's disproportionately lower, the number of representatives versus, versus the population itself? Well, there are a few factors uh, that contribute to that. Uh, it's not just one simple uh, answer. But one of them is, uh, is this lack of Latino participation in, in the political system, the structure uh, of the party. I would say. You know that our system calls for the parties either nominating, having candidates. It's not the general public or independent right. people that run. It's an inside game. It's an inside game by, run by two private organizations, the Republican and the Democratic Party, who determine uh, within their organization who's right. going to be on the ballot. Uh, so if you're not part of that organization, you will never be on a ballot. Uh, and Latinos don't have high representation at that level. You're trying to change it. We are trying to change it. We're trying to stimulate and increase the participation of Latinos in the political system, both within the parties and outside the party. As you might know, independent or unaffiliated voters in New Jersey are the majority, actually more than the sum of Republicans and Democrats hmm. together. And that reflects actually the trend nationwide. Uh, unaffiliated voters are really, you know, the sum of those uh, who are uh, affiliated to either party. Uh, so from that point, uh, we're also stimulating participation of all Latinos. You're also working with uh, the folks over at Berkeley College to try to change this dynamic. How? Well, Berkeley College is our partner in uh, the new project that we have launched, which is the Latino Leadership Academy. The uh, Latino Leadership, Leadership Academy. Academy. Go ahead. That is a 10-month course uh, where people aspiring to be uh, leaders in either in public office, public service, uh, will go through a very extensive boot camp kind uh, of a course covering all areas of leadership, from public speaking uh, to defining your mission, uh, public uh, ethics in, in public service, sure. uh, and so forth. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive But what's Berkeley's course. role in that? Uh, Berkeley is housing the project and will also uh, grant the, uh, the participants in the program a uh, continuing education credits for the 50 hours of, of work uh, that participants are, are taking place in. It's so interesting. If there's another component, is there a public safety component in all this? Yes. Uh, the Latino Leadership Alliance uh, founded back in 1999 uh, really responding to the growth of the, of the Latino uh, community and its need to be uh, unified in one voice, to have all voices of Latino uh, descent united or unified for the purposes of advocacy and representation in the state of New Jersey. So the alliance functions in commissions or committees of work, like education, uh, immigration, public safety, and civil rights, mm. uh, which is the one you mentioned, and, and they function as, as entities within uh, the alliance. What are they fighting for? Uh, overall, we are fighting for access, fair representation in New Jersey uh, at all levels of government. Well, in terms of public safety, what's the issue? Well, the main thrust of our Commission on Public Safety is to promote fair treatment and protection of, of civil rights for the population at large, but also for our law enforcement officers within departments, which is interesting, uh, because when you talk about uh, protection of civil rights, you usually uh, tend to think that it's just the general public. But we're talking about our own officers within departments. Oh, hold on. You're saying that, to some extent, those who are in law enforcement who are Latino are, in fact, somehow treated differently? Oh, absolutely. How so? When it comes to promotion and, and fair treatment at work, oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you know of uh, studies, both in the past and also recent, uh, with the state police and other yes. law enforcement officers where uh, our Latino or minority officers are not uh, given the same opportunities or afforded the same opportunities for uh, promotion and for treatment within the department. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have done under the leadership of Richard Rivera, uh, who's a retired uh, yes. state trooper, um, is uh, a couple of things. And the main one, we have established uh, units of community relations, community 
uh, law enforcement relations within mm. uh, prosecutor's offices, for example. Uh, we have conducted uh, investigations and submitted a, a report on fair treatment uh, in various police departments around New Jersey. And we have achieved, like I said, a major a, a component of what we consider a community law enforcement relations, which is the this establishment. Is oh, absolutely, absolutely. As you know, and we Two hear, uh, you hear uh, around the nation, if the community and the police are not working in conjunction, then right. policing uh, is not being effective at many levels. Well, more work needs to be done. And Doctor, thank you for talking about this important issue with many components, and I assure you, it won't be the last time we have this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Berkeley College, Valley National Bank, New Jersey Resources, Create, NJM, Josh S. Weston, and by Verizon. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. My name is Carly Lloyd, and I have been with NJM since I first started driving. I'm a World Cup champion and two-time Olympic gold medalist. If I could sum up NJM in one word, it would be extraordinary. Extraordinary means being the best at something, separating yourself from everything. I love being a part of NJM. They have the best insurance out there. Join NJM's family of policyholders today. Get a quote now at startyournjm.com.